Hey, Deserving Listeners. So Colin often sends me lists of possible episode ideas, and he sent me a list. And on that list was to watch Palm Springs, the movie, and talk about it. And I've been seeing it pop up on my Hulu suggestions for the past couple of weeks, and a lot of people are talking about it. It is perhaps the, you know, the movie of the week, shall we say. And I took him up on the offer, and the three of us watched it, Umberto and Colin and I. And it brings up some interesting questions about nihilism and the meaning of life and are rom-coms still in style? So let's talk about Palm Springs. What do you say, y'all? Let's do it. Checking in. This is the Psychology of Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Umberto? My name is Umberto Castaneda, and I'm a used CD salesman. Hello, I'm Colin. I'm from Texas, and I build bombs for people stuck in time loops. Nice. So if this sounds a little goofy, it's because we just spent the last literally 42 minutes trying to problem solve all of our, <laughs> all of our audio problems. And I won't point any fingers because this is an audio episode anyway, but just let it be known that it's, it's not my or Umberto's fault. So right, I'm going to provide a, a, a summary. <laughs> I'm going to provide a summary for the, for the, uh, so if it sounds a little goofy, it's because of that, but I really wanted to talk oh, with Colin and Umberto about this movie. And uh, also I think it'd be interesting to talk about, but anyway, just a brief summary. And this is total spoiler alert. Cause it is, Spoilers. A movie, it's a movie Palm Springs that, you don't want spoiled because there are very interesting, you know, plot developments as it happens. But anyway, so it is, it takes place at a wedding and an earthquake opens up a rift in time and Andy Sandberg falls into it and has to live the same day over and over and over again, like Groundhog Day. And he repeats the same day, perhaps thousands of times. He, ent- he goes into despair. He accidentally encourages Roy, this other guy at the wedding, to enter the cave. Roy gets real angry because now he has to live the same day over again. He tries to get revenge. Then Andy Sandberg, or Niles as his character, accidentally kind of entices Sarah to enter the cave. And so now Sarah is living the same day over and over and over again. Over time, Sarah and Niles fall in love. Sarah is scared of the vulnerability of falling in love. She lashes out. Niles reveals he had sex with her before, many times before she entered the cave. She leaves him and learns quantum physics, and they both enter the cave to blow themselves up to see if they're either just going to die and put themselves out of their misery or they're going to end the looping. And it turns out they ended the looping. So that's the end of the movie. But it is a rom-com, and it's, it's funny and cute and enjoyable. Uh, off the top, let's just give our ratings. Uh, Berto, what would you give it out of 10? I give it a 9. Wow. Why? I loved it. Now, by the way, I, I had heard the name. So when you said, hey, you should watch this because we're going to talk about it, I'm like, oh, I've heard that name. But I had not heard what it was about at all. Or if I had, it like went in one ear out the other. So when it started, I, I literally had no idea what kind of movie. I was like, oh, it's a comedy, obviously, because it's got uh, Andy or whatever his name is. And, uh, and then it starts. And then the first time it loops, I was, it was a total shocker for me. I was like, oh, that's what's going on. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, maybe it'll there, change over time. But for now, I'm a nine. There were some uh, callbacks to um, The Graduate. Could you tell? Yeah. Yeah. Like looking through the leg and jumping into the the pool and That's the, right. the nihilism yeah. vibe of it. Uh, Colin, what'd you give Which it? Which is one, and I think you're bringing that up because The Graduate's one of my favorite movies. Right, exactly. Yeah. I gave it a solid seven. Wow. So we I flipped today. What, yeah, what, what, what made it so that you didn't like it as much as Umberto? No, I don't, I didn't necessarily not like it. I think it's, it, it can be read as a very simple film and there's nothing wrong by the way with being a simple film, because I think that you can have a complicated movie executed poorly. That is garbage. And you can have a really expertly handled simple script that is flawlessly directed and acted and it can lift your spirits and be amazing. It's all about how, how it appears and how it feels to me. And I liked it. I just found myself losing it a bit in the days that followed. Um, it didn't, it didn't necessarily live in me as 
fervently as some other films had. And it's, it's hard to put a grasp on what, what that exactly is. But I think in the moment when you are watching it, which one could argue is the most important thing about a film, the actual experience of watching it, I think it's, you know, an eight or a nine. I think it's a phenomenal experience to watch. You know, Colin, it's interesting you say that, that it didn't stay with you. Cause one funny thing, you know how when uh, Avatar came out, all these people were like, oh God, I want to be, I want to live in Avatarlandia or whatever the hell it was called. And they were like, oh, I'm so sad I'm not there. Well, okay, I didn't experience that at all. But with this movie, I kind of did. I was like, there, even as the movie was reaching its end, I was so sad. I'm like, wait, but maybe, maybe they should stay. That. I was thinking about it. It's like, you're living forever and it's not a bad place to be. It's Palm Springs. God. And then as the movie ended, I was like, oh, I want to go back. I want to live that over with them. <clears throat> so it, it kind of did stay with me. Yeah, this is kind of your wet dream, Berto, because yes. you don't want to die. And this That's movie right. basically means you can live forever. Yeah, and you get it's, it's the best of all worlds because you retain memory, right? right? And you build on memory. I, I don't know what happens to your brain eventually because... But you're retaining memories day after day. So, so you are living forever. Now, if you already have family and you have this, such, like the dude is probably super upset, Roy, because he's like, I don't see my little girls growing up. But tomorrow is her birthday. I don't get to see her, birthday. you know, whatever, right? But if you're just like this carefree dude, like that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I, I'm like Colin, I gave it a seven out of 10 because I thought it was a thoroughly fun movie and if y'all are out there haven't seen it yet i highly recommend it as a as a kickback watching of a movie in a relaxed afternoon or evening and it's sort of thought provoking and it's it's never cheesy there was never a moment when i thought oh boy here we go <laughs> but it wasn't as colin was saying like super sophisticated it, it, i'm not going to think about it years later, like Inception or something like that, you right. know? That's fair. So, or even Groundhog Day for, for that matter. Um, but it's, it's perfectly serviceable. Seven out of 10 is a, is a great rating. Okay. So nihilism, let's talk about nihilism before we get into it. I'm going to ask you guys some questions, but before I get into that, as a caveat, I know enough about philosophy and nihilism to know that I don't know anything about nihilism and philosophy. So, if we have any philosophy nihilism people out there, I would just skip this whole episode because this is going to make your ears bleed because we're going to get everything wrong or we're just going to be incredibly simplistic about it. But unless, Colin, you have some surprise philosophy degree up your sleeve, which I maybe you do. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> Not up my sleeve, in my beard, though. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's where you hide your, your secret. <laughs> All uh, my degrees. degrees. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what those pieces of paper were shoved up in there. <laughs> Um, I thought you just cut yourself shaving, but that doesn't make any sense because you have a beard. What am I thinking? Okay. Moral of the story, <laughs> since this is Groundhog Day 2, essentially, uh, and Groundhog Day was in the 90s, right? And Palm Springs is now in the, I don't even know what we're calling these, the, the 20s? Are, are we the, in the roaring 20s. 20s. Yeah. By the way, uh, just quick interjection. Groundhog Day is one of my favorite movies of all time. So if I was going to rank the two, I'd still, I'd still give the edge to Groundhog Day. Uh, but there are a couple of parts of this one that actually reach a little deeper into the, into the um, questions, into the underlying questions that are pro proposed by such a movie. Right. Yeah, you could tell that the writers really thought, okay, let's look at this from all the angles and then construct a story that includes those elements. And is, from my eyes, wasn't cheesy. There was never a moment where I thought, okay, here we go. The writer has something to say about life. It was all seamlessly written into the characters that felt natural in the moment. It wasn't until I, 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 so I watched it and then I rewatched it to take notes for this episode. And it was only then that I was like, oh, the writers snuck in a lot of, of ideas that are pretty profound that just kind of blew past me in the moment as, as the story was going. Anyway, so Groundhog Day, Colin, what's the moral of the story? By the end of Groundhog Day, what are we supposed to walk away going, ah, I learned something about life? Our lives and the meaning that they entail is self-derived and to some degree must be discovered and oftentimes is helped in its definition 
by the ephemeral, eternal experience of connecting with another human being. Groundhog Day, right. Yeah. Berta, wh- what's the moral of the story that you would say of Groundhog Day? Um, although I don't disagree with that. I, I guess I put it in the sense that uh, he's a very selfish individual when the movie starts. Right. It's all about him. Right. And uh, the only way out of his predicament is to actually be all about everyone else. Right. And, and that's, you know, it's, yeah. so it's mostly about like connect with others, which is another way to, of what you were saying. Yeah. Right. That's what I would say is that Groundhog Day is mainly geared towards men, by the way. Because I don't know yeah. if women would watch Groundhog Day and really feel a connection to it. Because there's a, a 90s m- older sort of 30-year-old or 40-year-old man persona of cynical and not being nice and, and being above it all and you know rolling his eyes at things, which Bill Murray plays so well. And so I would say the moral of the story very simply is for men, not, any, not everyone, but just men, to be nice to other people, essentially. Because he's like you said, Berto, he starts off the movie being distant. An yeah, an, an a-hole. And then he, by the end of the movie, he's like, I've realized that I need to be nice to people because that's better to live that way. And, I'm not going to join you in your characters, characterization as men only, but I will agree with the rest. <laughs> well, I have, I have a hard time believing that a lot of women watch Groundhog Day and feel as connected to the story as they would if the lead was a woman for example you know his i think that i i think you're maybe touching on he he does manipulate or uh, correct me if i'm wrong because i might be getting the actress wrong but he sort of tailors situations um that could be defined as manipulation in terms of his relationship with annie mcdowell you know oh, like yeah. there's he's he's he is using her to some degree in several scenes in that movie and so i think that you're maybe touching on like uh, how much do i like this guy if i but you're right. I mean, if you, you stick with you him, obviously cast he gets it with better. a woman. You could have cast you it with a woman. You could have had her be really into this one guy. And I guess the one variant that what they would have probably done is she needs to realize that's not the right guy for her. That would have been the, the difference. But I, I, I'm just saying, like, I, I don't disagree. Probably more of a guy's movie, maybe. You're right, probably. Well, but not, not you only that. could have made but... the same movie with a woman and tweaked it a bit and it would have. Yeah, well, I think you'd have to tweak it quite a bit for it to resonate because the bill murray character when this movie came out was like a version of a lot of men in the 90s you know there was a lot of dudes who were very much like or wanted to be like bill murray someone who's above it all sort of having his own private jokes is not connecting with anyone is cynical you know it's a cool persona to have is a particular male persona and I, and he transcended that through the movie and that was the moral story. But anyway, getting to Palm Springs, what's the moral of that story, Colin? I think it's more about listening than deriving meaning from self in terms of how you find value in others. Because in Groundhog Day, it was very much something that, even, even though obviously there were external influences and he dealt with other characters, um, he defined his, his new enlightenment. And I think that in this movie, First of all, you have a more active female lead and through their, you know, sort of the dynamic shift there. I think that he's listening throughout more of the movie. He's, he's less of an active protagonist than actually she is. And so he derives some kind of inspiration from how actively she participates, because even when she is making a mistake, like running a cop over who ends up not being a cop, but, you know, running somebody over with her car and not caring how she's hurting people. Um, she's always making choices and he's lost the ability to really make those choices. And so that, um, that sense of letting go of what you bring to the table that might be fucking you up and allowing somebody else and the, your admiration or what you learn from them to kind of get you out of your funk and, hmm. you know, Spirit, get you in a in a new direction that's maybe going to work out better for you. Huh, I like that, Berto. What's the moral of the story of Palm Springs? So, to me, this takes place if Bill Murray's character had gone through everything he did, and he first did all the little things, and he finally did get the girl, basically. Yeah, but that was still not enough to get out of the loop. Then he keeps going. 
because it turns out that this is no longer a loop built just for him to learn a lesson. It turns out that it's like some physics BS. So he's like, I'm stuck still. And then time goes on and then he can, he gains the girl multiple times because he's like, well, I already know all the steps. I've, I know the cheat codes. And then he loses, like Colin, what you're saying, he loses the plot. He's like, ah, oh, this is fine. I'm just going to do whatever. I can do whatever. I'm going to do nothing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the injection of the, of the, of the woman, she's the new protagonist in that moment. And she's the one now being like, wait, but she doesn't, she's not okay with eventually petering out. She has a different shorter fuse in that sense. And so at the end, we go from a character that's basically kind of decided that nothing matters. And he's just going to sit there in comfort doing nothing or something or whatever, because he doesn't care because nothing matters. His name is Niles. <laughs> to basically deciding that he's going to give it all up. <laughs> I just figured that out. I, I didn't yeah. even realize that in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to give up immortality for a girl, right? For a love, for a, for a relationship, which is sort of the micro version of the Groundhog Day. What the Groundhog Day was like, you got to care about others. This one's like, you got to be ready to give it all up for something. And so like, you got to care. And if there was a, a meta thing, it'd be like, it, things do matter. No, it is not true that nothing matters. That's the, the message of the movies. Things do matter. You got to find that one thing that you care about. And even if you have to blow yourself up at the rift, got to go for it. And I think that the immortality that you speak of that he thinks he's found ends up being death because you never get the sense of him f being immortal. Sure. Yeah. Like, I mean, obviously sure. the, there's, there's fun scenes and he gets to do quirky things, but most of the joy we see is because he's experiencing it with somebody that he likes. And so and he, I think his definition or rather the film's definition of what immortality actually is kind of shifts. And it becomes this thing that comes from a, a bond that you share with another human being that, that right. makes you feel immortal. So I, I, I did love that idea of immortality as well. Yeah. For me, the way I would put it, which I agree with everything you're saying, but the things I focused on was, Throughout the movie, because there's the end of the movie, which is perhaps what we would say, you know, then comes the moral of the story. But I think that the thing that I walked away with was a dialectic between life has no meaning and, and life is suffering and love is the meaning of life and appreciate the moment, essentially, or that life and the moment is because even throughout this before the end of the movie, even for Niles, he kind of vacillates between these two positions throughout the movie. He sometimes is saying like, yeah, life has no meaning. It's all pointless. And then in other moments, he's like giving a kid a hundred dollar bill because as a tip, because it makes him feel good. He's like, well, that kid just got a hundred bucks and, and he, hopefully he spends it today and that's good. So he, he vacillates between it's meaningless. This is suffering why try it doesn't matter uh to love is the meaning of life and appreciate you know that's more at the end but also just appreciate the moment and at the very least life is about not causing suffering for the self or other people because he says that at, at the height of their sort of nihilism you know he t he talks you know he yells at her he's like you can't just harm people yeah, sure. They will be reset the next day. They'll forget. They won't remember this tomorrow because the, the, everything will reset. But we remember. You, and if you harm other people, essentially you're harming yourself because you, you don't forget that, that you did that. And so I found that it was interesting. It was an interesting way of writing because it would have been tempting, I think, to write a story where he was just all life has no meaning, you know, and having all the jokes derived from how... Andy Samberg is just like completely cynical and nihilistic. Instead, you, you see him kind of struggling. He, he found kind of this balance by the thousandth or 10,000th day. By the way, how many days do you think he actually went through in terms of years? How many years has, has he been playing? Because it, it seemed, because I'll give two details. One, he doesn't remember his last job. He doesn't right. remember his job. So yeah. how long, cause I can remember jobs I had when I was 13 years old, which was 37 years ago or whatever. I can remember that job. I can, you know, visually, you know, recall it very well. 
So how many years would it have to be? And then, but two, he remembers his dog. So, and presumably he remembers like where he lives or something. So how many years do you think he's been looping? I go with five, but because the, the whole job thing, I explain away because the guy probably is a drifter a bit. So like he had a job for like three months before this. What was that job? That kind of thing. Oh, okay. As opposed to like, I worked at this company for 10 years and I don't remember for the life of me. It's my take. What do you think, Colin? Well, when you when you were leading up to this, my my immediate go-to was the situation of forgetting the job. So, God, at least a couple hundred. I mean, I have to. It, it have it have to be right? a couple hundred what days? Years? Oh, years. years? Right? Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought too. No, that's what I thought because it's possible. How can you when possibly she... forget? Right? If it's yeah. not. <laughs> Yeah, even if it was even if it was a three month drifter job, if it was the last job you had, you would remember it. The other thing is, is when she throws him a birthday party and says, "It's your millionth birthday," he goes, "It hasn't been that long, has it?" He he doesn't know. He doesn't yeah. remember. Yeah, but remember the his brain is presumably still following some physical limitations, <laughs> right? So he's not going to be able to cram indefinite amount. Now I I grant and look, it could just be a plot hole, right? Like yeah. Maybe maybe forgetting a job is a little too weird. But at the same time, depending we don't know what he did. Like the point is he doesn't remember. He could be he could have worked as like uh, one of those services where you literally go get a job every other day or something, whatever. I, I don't know. I'm going to go with five years. Maybe it's 20, <laughs> but yeah. I don't know. I don't think it could have been because there's also like a level of sanity thing. He wasn't insane yet. Right. I think 20 years would drive him insane. Well, he did say that he had sex with Sarah hundreds of times. He did say that. Yeah. But that could have happened over a week. <laughs> Yeah, right. So, and maybe he was exaggerating, but I liked anyway. that too, that the writers left enough amb ambiguity where you just never really knew. Yeah. Um, by the way, there's a YouTube channel that does a, like a 10 minute comedy version of Groundhog Day that I cannot remember right now, <laughs> but I recommend people look for it. It's, it's actually a, a, a two man comedy troupe that is actually oh. hilarious. I saw one, it was a short where it was a guy sitting on a bench and a girl and a gal sitting oh, yeah. on a bench. That, I've seen that. That one's pretty good too. That's not Groundhog Day. That's just a no, time it's, machine. Well, it's Minute Groundhog. Right. It's Groundhog Minute or something. Groundhog Minute, yeah. But the, the one the other thing I was going to add is that in these movies, one thing they never explore is, yes, he's immortal, technically, supposedly, right? But, but there is this limitation because the starting point each, first of all, it's only one day and he's always starting physically from the same location. Um, uh, you know, and so what's funny about it is like, take a video game. Let's say he wanted to beat, uh, you know, the last of us part two or something. He can't unless he somehow buys saved games on the internet every day or something like that. You know, he himself can't sit there throughout one day and beat any video game that's significant enough to play. And that's just a trivial example. But like, for example, if he was like, I'm going to build a rocket, he can't, he can't do anything that would take longer than a day to do. He can learn because he remembers, but um, so like things like learning how to play the piano, ditto, you know, but things like I'm going to create a company and I'm going to take, no, I can't do any of that stuff. I'm going to go, you know, so that's an interesting thing they don't quite explore in these movies is the limitation of that starting point and the day limit. It's like, I'm going to make a movie where it's Groundhog Year and see how much you can do in a year <laughs> or actually better, Groundhog Life. You go through a whole life and then you start over with, and, and, then, and then you have all these like problems because you're like, but I had this family and now I got to. So the first few times through, you try to recreate your family and only to realize it's impossible. You couldn't possibly get all the variables to line up. And then eventually you're like, uh, then you go through your nihilism phase and then it, and it loops around. It's probably going to be a TV series because I don't think- I was going to say, it movie. should be a TV series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Colin, let's just get to the heart of the matter. What is the meaning of life to you? The meaning of life is to never stop- exploring and to readjust reinvigorate when you feel like you have nothing left to explore because I've always found that when I'm at my lowest I feel like there's nothing left to learn nobody that I can connect with and I'm isolated so 
to me, what I very much saw in Niall's character is an inability to move forward in any conceivable way. And so, yeah, I guess that's my, those are my two cents. Berto, meaning of life. Uh, so I don't think there's such a thing as a meaning of life. Um, I, I personally have a, you would call it a, a, a faith-based belief that there are, there's a choice between uh, one and zero. So there's either we are going to try to keep this thing going. So we're going to try to do things that create, not destroy, pre- preserve, not, you know, um, uh, kind of use up all the resources. We're going to try to expand. We're going to try to see if we can at a universal level become conscious and save ourselves from collapse or expansion, those kinds of things. Uh, and there's no good reason. It's just a decision. You either participate or you don't. And you're already participating because if you don't, you're basically participating to not try. So that's it. Me, one word, love. All right, let's take a break. and we get back, let's continue the conversation. Love it. All right, we're back from the break. Umberto, if Bill Murray in Groundhog Day were to ask everyone to become a a patron of the podcast, what would he say? Let's say it's like midway through the movie. Uh, So you and I have never met. uh, But I have a sense that you live in a very nice place. It's two stories. Oh, I'm right? Wow, interesting. Um, the thing is your pet. Oh, how did I know you have a pet? Well, let's just say I have a, I have a sense about people. And you know when you look at your pet and you're like, you see in their eyes how much they care about you? Imagine if there was something you could do so that you could feel that same care back. Oh, okay, this didn't work. Oh, so imagine if there was something you could do so you could be like a pet. Okay, then. Imagine if there was something you could do so the pet was the one caring for you. Ah, yes, indeed. Well, there is, and it's called becoming a patron. It's like, oh, and, well, there is, and it's called going to patron. Well, there is. <laughs> Just become a patron. <laughs> Wow, that was meta. It actually took me a half a second to realize what you were doing. <laughs> yeah, you're getting to see the because uh, you're watching the movie. You're you're not only the receiver of the right. pitch. You're yeah, watching the movie. I'm I'm seeing the hard cuts. Yes. <laughs> so, Colin, you wake up. You're Andy Samberg. You're Niles, and you you get over the shock after let's say 300 cycles. What do you do with your time? Well, I certainly don't feel like my inclination would be to respond to the situation like the lady in the film. I feel bad just referring to her as lady. I, I don't remember her character name Sarah. or her actress name. Sarah. She, thank you. She is my favorite character in the fucking movie, and I loved her performance. Anyway, I definitely don't think I would try to figure out quantum physics. I, I don't <laughs> think I would. I feel like I would try to do something new every single day. And... I honestly, I think that I would try to have really close relationships with as many people as I could. Like, okay, so let me let me explain. I do have this inclination, I think sometimes where I go, gosh, what could that be? Like with this particular person, there's, there's so much there's potential here, there's potential for us to explore certain things that sometimes I feel this with friends or sometimes with total strangers. And yet sometimes in the context of the moment or in the context of my life, just given whether I'm single or if I'm, you know, whatever the situation is, I feel like things are not explored. But in this scenario, then I would be somewhat free from some of the constraints of society. And I would probably just explore like a curious octopus moving from cave to cave. Ew. So like... With relationships? Relationship caves? Re- no. <laughs> Not that. No, no, no. I, I was a, Did you say a metaphor. Because metaphor you said only. like an octopus? Yeah. <laughs> They're my favorite animal. I was oh, okay. trying to think of like what I would, what animal I would be in this hypothetical future. I mean, I love, I octop- I love octopus. octopuses as well, but I find that they are uh, a little ew to me when you see him kind of oh. crawling around. Yeah, sometimes when I come to Seattle, we'll have to go scuba diving and you'll have to dance with the giant Pacific octopus because they will dance with you. Oh. Yeah. Have you danced with him before? 
No, I've I got my certification, but I've never actually made the trip up north or gotten dry suit certified, as I've been told you will need to do if you would like to dive in the sound. Interesting. But, yeah. So uh, you would explore what? Romantic. I say romantic, but I just mean the most intimate possible connections with as many people as I could. And I know that sounds probably a little creepy to some, but basically I, I would know in my head that I don't have a long-term commitment with anybody because I don't have that option available to me. Yeah. So I would try to, you know, create newness, create new experience with as many people I could love, if you want to use the word love yeah. as possible. Intimacy where you really get to know them well whether yes. that leads to romance or just a deep friendship where you're using drugs with Roy in the, in the desert, then that's what it means. Right. Right. Because I would think that in this, one of the things I would like the most is that I could say how I really feel because I think in a lot of scenarios I'm, I can be preoccupied with, well, this is, this is something that might, you know, ruffle feathers or maybe, you know, or, I guess I sometimes feel hyper aware of the context of relationships, things that are prescribed by culture or things that I know they, they represent or they believe or their moral justifications. And so I would, I think I would be a little, I would feel a little more free to just be like, Hey, this is how I feel about you. This oh. is what I'd like to do. What do you, yeah. what do you think about that? Yeah, I can get behind that. I like that. It occurred to me, I wonder how many white people on the very first day would just say the N-word all day long because they could get away with it? <laughs> that would certainly not be me, although I do have a horrifying memory. I think it's, you've done a whole video on, on your racism, so I'll, I'll sprinkle in a nugget. I lost a game of Smash Brothers, and so I hurled a lot of obscenities at nobody it just because we, we were just having a crazy fun time. And so it was in the heat of the moment. And I just, that was one of them that oh. I had screamed. But it still haunts me because immediately after it, it was like the word that you can't take back. And I was like, fuck, 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 fuck. I am like, and I apologize to everybody. I'm like, I'm so sorry that that happened. But yeah, no, that would not be me because th that's like the one time I can remember saying it. it well, let me, me. I, I, you don't have to answer <laughs> this question, Colin, but had you ever said the word before? I feel like I must have. But I have no memory of them. It would have been, it would have been in relation to some kind of music I was listening to that I probably shouldn't have been repeating, okay. just because that there's there's like to me sometimes a lack of cultural awareness when people just decide that they're that it's okay to say it because yeah. they love this particular piece of music and it's mentioned, and that to me is like a very that's the very wrong way to to look at it because there's so much behind that word that really like you're just that's the tip of the iceberg and. And yeah. that was his right to say in that song because, you know, he represents a part of that story. Right. So. Yeah. It's interesting because to me, I can't imagine that being an expletive because it doesn't occur to me, you know, it's, it's a word. I was just wondering like, cause I don't think I, I don't live in a world where that, I don't listen to hip hop. So I don't hear that word mm. very much if at all. And I certainly have, if I had said it, it would have been when I was maybe 12 and and maybe exactly. maybe even then, though, it would have been like just out of curiosity of what it sounded like coming out of my mouth. But I certainly have never said it in anger or even in right. sort of just joking or something. Having said that, I, it wasn't that long ago that I was in a group of men who were using the word white white men mm -hmm. using the word in in a jokey way. And I could not believe my ears it was just That's like the not okay. weirdest thing and I, I would i could even tell you their profession which would make it even worse but i, I won't say that um Alberto, okay. let's get this uh podcast back on the rails and off <laughs> off of the uh n-word conversation you wake up on the 500th 500th day you've you've done all the experiments you're locked in there's no options what do you do for the rest of your life Oh, first I'd start screaming the N word every minute. <laughs> nihilism, nihilism, nihilism. Oh, God. Um, then I'd start singing. All I wanted was a sweet distraction for an hour or two. Had no intention to do the things we've done. 
And then I would uh, seriously look at my life. So you know what? I was thinking about this as you were talking. At first I thought, well, you got to try for the perfect speed run. Meaning, you know, it, it's, it's the Groundhog Day angle, but like at a more global scale, like what could you actually accomplish in 24 hours? You don't need to sleep, right? So you get definitely pulling an all-nighter. And rather than, I mean, like, rather than limit yourself by what you don't know today, you could essentially assume that whatever plan you want to formulate, uh, within some physical limitations, of course, you could uh, take as much time as you want to learn the things you need to do and then perfect that plan. Uh, when I say physical limitations, like if your plan is like, well, I'm going to go join the NBA and win the, okay, the, obviously that can't happen for a billion reasons. But if, but it, see what your perfect run, <clears throat> speed run could be that day. How much good could you accomplish, right? Like you're going to go change politics. You're going to change the UN. You're going to somehow influence the world. And you're probably not going to be able to, but maybe. But, but that's the challenge is how far could you push it? I was thinking about that. Then I thought, well, <clears throat> I mean, that's assuming I can keep my sanity. The fact is, after a few days, it might only take like three, honestly you're going to get really depressed and it's going to hit you really hard because, you know, we're sitting here talking about it like, ah, it's so fun. And I'm like, oh, it's immortality. But look how, look how difficult it is for people to stay at home for two weeks. And all of a sudden they're like, ah, I'm, I can't get a haircut. We need to be back out. Open us up. Open. Let alone you've gone two days in a row where you're realizing, <laughs> oh my God, wait a minute. This is actually what's my new reality. And like you wake up and you're like, shit, this is real. And then you go to have that conversation and it's no longer a cute moment in a movie with a funny comedian. It's you frustrated because no matter what you say to this person or do, it doesn't change anything. So I'm sorry, but I think I would have to like probably try to start finding a, a cure, a way out, which is what the gal was trying to do. So I think I'd be more on the gal's yeah, uh, on okay. Sarah's plan. So at the end of that process, you discover nothing. You spend 10,000 years trying to figure it out. Oh, my you, God. I, I don't know if my sanity is still there. Would you kill yourself? Because <laughs> uh, uh, Niles, Niles tried to kill him, but he tried. Would you try oh, yeah, to kill yeah. him? I, don't, I can't speak for my mental state at that point. Because first of all, how, how much can a human brain hold? Certainly not 10,000 years worth of, of data. No, right? you'd so, forget most of it. Yeah, most of it, right? So in some ways, I'm, I'm thinking like... The way I feel right now, no, I wouldn't try to do that because I would be too afraid that it would be permanent. So I wouldn't. But you don't know what it would be like. Everyone's like, you know, it's the whole Mike Tyson thing. Everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. That's I feel that way. I'm like, yeah, I, I can say, but yeah, like, ten thousand years. Yeah, I didn't realize what you were saying earlier until you just said, you know, that bit of the video game. You you can't finish The Last of Us too. Yeah, in that. Every because so much of our meaning in our life or enjoyment is feeling like we're iterating on something, right? Right. You you add on to your house or you move to yeah. a different place or you build your bank account or something right. or you make your way through a degree or at, with this podcast we build a catalog of episodes in the past and to feel like you and, and I guess I have a very small version of this, which is occasionally, I would say five to 10 times out of over a thousand episodes over 12 years, I've lost episodes after recording. In fact, Birdo and I were recording a reaction video to Star Wars, uh, Phantom Menace, a couple of weeks ago, and I completely lost the recording. So and sad. and so, so we resolved that we would actually do it over again and act like we hadn't done it. Yeah. <laughs> and... The thought of that is mind numbing on a certain level, but it's like, we have to, that's the only way to do it. Uh, Cause we're on a project of, 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 you know, reacting to Star Wars movies. And we had to do it and, with D D too. Yeah. Right. We had to do it in Dungeons and Dragons. We had to completely start over with Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And the, if I had to do that, just doing it once, just reliving like an hour of my life once. Yeah. <laughs> what with someone that is also living it with me, you know, like we're right. we're together on it. What was is not pleasant. I cannot imagine doing that every day. Even what you're talking about, Colin, which sounds nice, of like having romance. It, it in the way that in this the movie Palm Springs, 
it wasn't really until Sarah and Niles were having that that building of a relationship over several days, several years maybe, did it become meaningful to him again. You saw him by the point he, that he was, he, he didn't seem like he, he seemed like he had developed relationships with all sorts of people, maybe not meaningful relationships in the way that you're talking about, Colin, but, but maybe. So it is interesting to think about. And at first I would think I wouldn't kill myself because I, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I'd be able to figure out something to entertain myself. But then I think about a lot of what it entertains me has to do with the constancy of my past. You know, I, yeah. I wrote a song and, well, maybe that would be it. It's like I could, I could just write songs and hold them in my head, I guess. And then you're like, because it, it would keep coming up. Oh, okay, tomorrow I, oh, no, there is no tomorrow, right? Yeah. Like, hey, can you come over? Tomorrow you can't, ah, you can't do it today. Yeah. Ah. And that's what would kill me. And so that's why really the truth is I would, and when you say, what would you do? Nothing well. I would not handle it well. I would probably end up being devastated by my inability to form lasting connection because that's something that is utterly essential to my everyday being. And I would connect to a video game, actually. It all comes back to video games, I guess, that um, where I really... I think this is captured very well. It's it's one of the Zelda games for the N64. Majora's Mask! Majora's Mask. And it was one of the first games where I remember the world being really working. Like, what I mean by the world is really working is that it's spinning. And the people are, the NPCs are going about their daily lives. And they have set schedules. And so as you, the whole gimmick of the game is you play the Song of Time and you start a three-day cycle over. So you know when... Andrew's going to be working at the Stockpot Inn. You're like, oh, it's nine o'clock. Like, she's going to be there. So one of the things that I think is really interesting psych psychologically about that game is that you do become devastated over time of having to let go of the good that you do. So you go to the swamp and you save the princess and you save the monkey and the monkeys and the Dekus are... You have no idea what these mean. I, 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 there's no reason you should. It's not an episode about Majora's Mask. Be two warring races, in, in other words. Like, you, you sort of get them together, and the swamp is peaceful, and there's no more pollution, and there's a very real effect of your goodness and what you brought to this area that then you have to let go. Because if you don't play the Song of Time, the world will end. And so that wanes on you as a child when i played it i didn't finish the game because i was too devastated having to, oh, like, really? to say goodbye mm -mm. yeah i had to finish it wow. later in life um so yeah that would that would probably happen to me and i would i would plunge into an absolute pit of despair yeah <laughs> so what i thought of and I, i'm curious if you had thought of this is i would make a case to people of going through the cave with me and it 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 wouldn't be one of those things where I accidentally or so I would, I would spend a day or many days building up a case for people at the wedding or whomever I could talk to who could manage to get to the cave. And I would say, so I don't, I know this is not believable, but let me prove it to you. I know everything about your past. I know everything about your past. Why? Because I've lived the same day over and over and over again. It's sort of like the movie lived. I repeat or uh, yeah. the edge of tomorrow. Oh, That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, eventually, Tom Cruise figures out how to convince the general because he's been there so many times. He knows the exact way to lay it out so that he at least he believes him. It's like, wait, so you're telling me you've lived the same day over and over again? And I would actually try at least. And I think it would work. I think there would, you could, because the thing, the thing I would try to sell, if I thought I was stuck, and I was either going to try to kill myself or otherwise, I think I would say, this is all I have. I'm not going to drag anyone through. I'm not going to, you know, do this to anyone involuntarily, but, I, but I'll make a case to the whole wedding and I'll say, here's my case to everyone. We can all live forever as a, as a little commune and our time will actually progress because our relationships will progress over time. The yeah. world will repeat the same day over and over and over again, but we have, and, our, and, the, and the material items of this world will reset every day, but we as a collective can have a new, can have a life together forever. And 
I, I'm, I'm telling you all this because I would like to not do this alone and it's up to you. And if no one does it, then no one does it. But I would imagine question, that some people, yeah, um, uh, the guy yeah, the, with the, the guy with the red shirt in the back. Yeah, this sounds really, <laughs> this sounds really great. Actually, I'm totally intrigued. Just a qu- quick question: What happens to kids? Like, if a kid goes through this, do they age? No. Oh, well, because I got nobody kids. ages. I, oh, because I, I got two kids. Like, what, what are we gonna do with the kids? It's up to the kids. The kids have to make the choice. Now, my, like, grandpa here with Alzheimer's, if they go through, the, do they get reset to, like, when they didn't have Alzheimer's, or they're still Alzheimer's? They're still Alzheimer's. Will they keep forgetting more, or they'll stay where, at the level of forgetfulness they got now? I don't know. And but so, this like, is the work that Kirk would be doing. He would be asking these questions, and so the people that re- reject it won't go through the cave, right? Yeah, they'll I think, I think you'd, you'd probably have to get loners, or, or maybe not loners, but... Um, I think as soon as you have a lot of close ties to other people, this becomes a problem, especially if there are age gaps, because like, you know, you well, Berto, let me, let me, let me ask you. So let me, let's say you're at this wedding and (laughs) you're by yourself and someone, you know, pitches this idea to you. You can live forever this and you never die and you can learn and learn and learn and learn and learn. So there's pros and there's cons, but you will right. never die and you'll never get sick. As, you know, as long as you're not sick today, you'll never get sick. And right. you can eat whatever you want. You can drink as much as you want because the next day you don't wake up hungover unless you woke up this morning hungover. You, every, everything will just be as it was when you woke up this morning. Would you take it? I uh, don't think I could, but what I might do is say like, well, maybe we could, uh, I, I, if the rift is still here tomorrow and the next day, which it might not be, I feel like if we could tweak the parameters so that the reset switch is at a hundred years, then I'm in. <laughs> but see, there's a, this is, this is the series. What we're talking about now, like this shit is what really could make a very interesting series on this premise. And yeah. I think this is why it's more of a seven for me as opposed to a 10, because this is a 10 fucking premise. <laughs> I would love to watch, because imagine the conflicts of people that say and do things exactly as, as Umberto is suggesting, you know, the, the, the things that would end up becoming problems that weren't problems at the beginning or the things that are glorious, you know, there'd be a mixture of positive and negative and in between and, and how everybody reacts to it. And like maybe cults form and like, people who go through the, you know, go through the thing at, at one point having this enlightenment, maybe they get jaded and kind of like the, um, Roy the guy. JJ, the JJ Jonah Jameson. <laughs> oh my God. I love that actor. I can't believe I just left his name just left my head. Um, mm-hmm. anyway, but yeah, so just that variance would be delicious. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I would try to do. I would try to at least one of the you know, years I spent uh, waking up every day, I'd be like, maybe I can get some people to come through with me voluntarily. And if they hated it, well, they could try to kill me, but I'd wake up the next day. <laughs> yeah, you, I think, I feel like there, there's some categories of people you probably have to rule out. Anyone who was sick that day, especially very sick, mm-hmm. probably doesn't want to go through, right? Like, I'm going to have a cold for the rest of eternity? But I bet you if, you, if you actually sold it to people of, I have been doing this for 10,000 years. And so you could, you, you could die 40 years from now or, and, you know, you could, and get yeah. sick occasionally. And then, you know, the last 10 years of your life be sick often Right. Or you can live the next 10,000 years of your life. And yeah, sick. you're, you're kind of sick. Um, and, and we could learn together how to cure your sickness. Maybe, you know, maybe there's some way we could figure it out after 10,000 years. And then infinite years later, Satan shows up. Surprise. This is hell. <laughs> yeah. So I, that would, that would be, that's just one of the things that popped into my head is like, I would I'd try to try to get people to come in. All right, let's and, conclude here. So I want to go over just some notes I had that I was taking of likes and dislikes. So what I liked about the movie, in addition to what I've already said, is that it's a legit rom-com for today's young people, I thought. Um, I thought it was 
you know, geared towards today's young people who I think are smarter than we were when we were the, when we were Groundhog's Day age. <laughs> um, I also thought it was well acted. Like I said, it wasn't cheesy. I liked how it started. The movie started with him already in the loop instead of showing how he got there. I liked that they had the woman who was the one who figured it out instead of the man. That's that's quite a twist from normal movies. I liked how there was an Asian in the movie that didn't have an Asian accent. He actually had, a, I think, an Australian accent, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, whenever there's an Asian in a TV show or a movie, I, I see their face and I... I'm like on the edge of my seat hoping that he doesn't have an Asian accent. You know, it's, it's like, I mean, obviously if it's a movie about Chinese people, then they're going to have an accent, but so many times it's like an Asian walking down the street of New York and he opens his mouth and he has an accent. Even though 6% of Americans are Asian Americans who don't have accents, meaning they have American accents. But my favorite thing of all time of the movie was the ending song is my favorite Hall and Oates song of all time when the morning comes. Yeah. When I was in college, and Umberto, you remember the Cellophane Square store, which was a used record store. And oh, yes. It, they would sell records because every, everyone was getting rid of their records. And so they just had stacks and stacks of old records. And for 25 cents, I could, I could buy classic records, Led Zeppelin, Hall and Oates, Elvis Costello, R.E.M. And I picked up this really old, one of the very first Hall, Hall and Oates albums, and I put it on my record player. And this is one of the, I think it's track one on that album. And I was like, I've never heard this Hall and Oates song before. It's amazing. And I've been playing it every, I mean have you heard that Hall and Oates song that they played at the end? Have you ever heard that song? I don't know. Yeah, it's it's so. it was a I minor have... minor hit, but most people have never heard that Hall and Oates song. Did you even know it was Hall and Oates that the last song? I no. guessed it it had to, like the the voices are what they are, but I yeah. I didn't. But then again, there's a lot of songs that like you'll be like, "Well, this is such and such band that you should know." And yeah. So, I didn't think too much about it, but that's really interesting. Yeah, I love that song. Um, I didn't like that very occasionally Andy Samberg would go into his super goofy acting. Even, like when he was running away from Roy, he he runs like with his arms flailing out. And I just thought he it's like because he's so used to acting like like a goofball, you know, <laughs> but this role did not call for that level of goofiness, you know, Um I also didn't like the fact, and this is co common to a not, lot of movies and TV shows, is they want to make Andy Samberg seem like this chill bro, and he's drinking beer all day long, never drunk, never, ever drunk. <laughs> like, <laughs> you put two and a half beers in the average person, they're going to start slurring their words, their eyes are going to be a little half-masked, and there's always some effect. You know, that's why people drink. They don't drink beer because of the taste. You know, you drink beer to get to get faded, if you will. And they never showed that, which isn't a huge deal, but it's just another, it's just a little thing. That reminds me of another case that I would say no, because you're like, okay, people, you could come with me to the cave. You could live forever. And I'm like, do you remember what last night, dude, the night before the wedding, we got smashed. I am feeling terrible right now. I don't want to live through an infinity of hangover days. Yeah. The other thing that's always in a lot of movies and TV shows is whenever they're drinking beer, it's always this totally random uh, movie label a brand of beer. It, it was right. like a, it looked like a beer can that was based on Tecate, but it wasn't Tecate. And I don't understand that. I don't understand why you can't just have like a brand of a beer. Like if you're you could drink a Diet Coke, why does it have to be like? Diet Cola. Why can't it be an actual brand? Like people walk around with iPhones. Uh, I don't. I don't understand why all brands can't. You know, it, it takes me out of. It's like, what's your number? Five 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 four. You know, it, it immediately makes me. Oh, this is Hollywood because that yeah. that beer doesn't exist, and we're in a but Hollywood world. Then when they world. put the real beer, then then people complain that it was product placement. <laughs> I I wouldn't see it that way, especially if. It was in all movies, you know, at this point, yeah. if you do see a label, you're like, oh, it must be product place because that never happens. Yeah. But if they did it more often, I, I don't know. I just don't understand. I don't understand the world of 
trademarks in movies. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Would it bother you if they did some kind of clever homage to a theme or an, an element of the storytelling? So, for example, if this beer was called like the bomb, you know, because like, there's a, I don't know, or something like, or kind of clever like that, or he just or he looked at the beer at the beginning of the movie and said huh i've never seen this brand before <laughs> or you know just some comment mm-hmm. of like that is a bizarre like <laughs> I, i've you know i'm 49 years old i've i probably in my brain know 75 brands of beer and so if i see a brand of a beer and i've never seen it before i immediately say what is it? and <laughs> that beer was throughout the movie i mean it there were dozens and dozens of cans of that beer throughout the movie. So it wasn't well, just like... How you go to Palm Springs, though? Maybe <laughs> yeah. Palm Springs. Yeah. Um, only get it there. Yeah. What's your number? Five, 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 one, two, three, four. Um, so this is the Lonely Island crew, the uh, a- Andy Samberg and the other guys. You, you might know them from, like, Dick in a Box. I'm on a boat. Yeah, I'm on a boat, that kind of thing. <laughs> But one of my favorite movies, which I think I gave 10 out of 10, is their very first movie, 2007, Hot Rod. Has, has anyone what? seen it? You gave 10 out of 10? Yeah. I haven't seen it, but I'm surprised. I, I didn't give it a 10 out of 10. <laughs> yes, I saw it. <laughs> and I'm not defending it, but I love this movie. Okay. I find it to be I'll hilarious. It. Um, it's, it's a total bro movie, but I, I just think it's hilarious. They also made MacGruber, which I haven't seen, which I want to see. I, I heard that it's a terrible, awesome movie. Uh, people might know the movie Pop Star, Never Stop, Never Stopping, which was a take on, never, you know, Andy never Samberg. Stop, never Stop, Yeah. Andy Samberg plays like a Justin Bieber sort of person. Lonely Island also did Michael Bolton's Big Sexy Valentine special three years ago. Whoa. And they also did the unauthorized Bash Brothers experience, which I haven't seen. Whoa. So I, I thought we would end listing off the best rom-coms of all time. Berto, name as many awesome rom-coms as you, as you possibly can. Good ones that you actually respect and like. All right. But uh, really quick before I do that. Uh, I did want to say that when the movie started... Oh, two, two quick things. When the movie started I, and I saw the actress, Sarah... For a second, I was like, oh, is that Ali- Alyssa Milano? And then I'm like, no, no, no. Wait, is that the girl from How I Met Your Mother? But I was thinking it was the girl from the the band camp girl. And then I'm like, well, no. Oh, no, that is the that, that is the mother from How I Met Your Mother. And I like, because I couldn't place her. Um, but then I was really happy because she's a great actress. Yeah. And she was totally wasted in How I Met Your Mother. But anyways. She was also this- in... The U.S. Callister episode of Black Mirror. Right, right. And she's yeah, also yeah. a parent. Oh my God, I forgot. Yeah. yeah. And she's also in Riverdale, according to my wife, which I have to say because I don't want to be disgraced as if to say I watched that stupid show. I don't, I don't Kirk, you got to hate watch it. You want to talk about <laughs> get your favorite can of beer, the bomb, favorite best <laughs> bomb. brand. <laughs> the other thing I was going to say <laughs> is that uh, this is why I hate watching previews and why I loved that I knew nothing about this. Because I guarantee you that most people knew what yeah. was up from the beginning of the movie. Yeah, in the preview, so, it completely lays out it's like Groundhog Day. Right, and I didn't see the preview or anything. So that whole first se- imagine if that whole first sequence when he's being a dick at the wedding and he's like, and you have no idea why. Yeah. And then this guy starts shooting him and you're like, what is going on? Yeah. I just thought it was so great. But anyways, all right. So uh, greatest rom-coms. Um, when Harry Met Sally is in there. Okay. Um, oh, Philadelphia. Sto- wait, Philadelphia Story. Philadelphia Story with uh, Cary Grant. Oh, because Philadelphia Story also is with, or that's Philadelphia. Yeah. With Philadelphia Tom Hanks. Story. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, the... Uh, What's it called? Splash is good. Oh, yeah. That's Splash. Good, good call. Um, uh, I would say, oh, I guess I don't think that counts. What? Rom-com wise. But The Princess Bride is kind of. Yeah, no, that's kind of, considered, that's considered <laughs> a rom- all right, all right, I mean, all it's right, romantic right. and it's a comedy. Okay. Um, and then probably Shrek. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't, yeah, I didn't thought of Shrek. That's a, that's a good yeah. one. Colin, what do you think? I liked all of those. Great choices, Berto. I would put Alex Strangelove in the ba- in the bunch. 
What's but, that one? Oh, nobody knows what it is. So Alex Strangelove? It's on Netflix. It's oh. it's I I thought it was going to be like the bisexual rom-com that we needed, but you know, it's about a struggling gay person, of course. But anyway, it's it's like a really cute um John Hughes-esque take on somebody who's developing, you know, feelings and they're not sure how to deal with them. And he also he's a huge cephalopod nut, so I'm a, a little bit biased. I would say ultimately <laughs> probably how to lose a guy in 10 days mm. just because i think it's extremely rewatchable mm. it's it's one of those movies where when you try to reproduce it it doesn't work which they tried to do with those two actors in something called fool's gold and it was just an absolute oh, yeah. clusterfuck yeah, and exactly. and i think matthew mcconaughey like he's so great you know in as we know him today but for a while he was in really bad movies like failure to launch because of yeah. <laughs> because of how to lose a guy in 10 days even though i do think that the original is good um i really like my best friend's wedding mm. i think that julia roberts mm. for me you know is is like a staple of the rom-com genre it was what you know her films were the ones that i watched when i was a kid because she was my mom's favorite actress mm. as i'm sure she's many moms of you know 90s mom's favorite actress and so yeah, that was my favorite of the bunch because I like the dynamic between her and I'm explaining all of these. You just asked me to list. Them. <laughs> this was like five hours. Okay. I'm going to shut up and just list the rest. Okay. So that was three. Um, I like love Simon. I don't know that I put it in top 10, but I'm going to throw that out there. Um, I really enjoyed, Oh gosh. What is the one with Jennifer Connelly and like, Oh, in the, in the, uh, they're stuck yes, in a target. Yes. What is that? Um, oh man, oh, I, I was. Can, I, I just. Liked it a lot. I just watched a. Uh, so Jennifer Connelly, Target, oh, Target career opportunities. Oh Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. I like that one. Yeah. That's a good one. That's good. And by the way, that oh. the actor I forgot earlier. Frank was Whaley. Simmons. Oh, J.K. Simmons. Yes. Yeah, that was, and I love him too. Um, by the maybe way, that's, that's all off the top of my head right now. That's funny because I, I just given watched an honorary. I should have given an honorary mention to Ten Things I Hate About You. Right. Oh yes, 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 yes. Oh, and she's the man. I like <laughs> that one a lot. With with the the fallen from grace. Um, I hope she's she's doing well. Um, Amanda Bynes. So this is my long list with most of my favorites at the top. So I'm just gonna rattle them off. The big the big sick. I highly recommend if you haven't se yeah. if you haven't seen the big oh. sick. Fuck yeah, that's the best one. It I've, is uh, tops all of mine. Yeah. Oh good, because that is yeah. a near perfect comedy. It is so yes. good. I'm also gonna say Roxanne with uh, yeah with, with Steve Martin. Steve Martin. I'm also gonna say Great. Punch Drunk Love, which is considered a rom com. Very good. That's Great. a good one. Um, I'm also going to say Always Be My Maybe. Shout out to my Asian brothers and sisters. Oh, I need to watch that. Which, of course, you haven't seen because you're not Asians, and I hate you. Just joking. <laughs> um, I'm going to say Kissing Jessica Stein because it was the first lesbian movie that was mainstream that I ever saw. Mm. And, I, and I remember thinking it was great back then in 2001. Uh, Her, the movie Her, you could kind of consider as like a rom-com. Mm. Pil Scott Pilgrim, Princess oh, yeah. Bride, Warm Bodies, the zombie rom-com. Yeah, that's a good one. Really good. Okay, here. so you're you're talking like okay, rom com adventure. Do they those work? Well, I, if that's the case, then I would have said Romancing the Stone like easily. Totally, mm -hmm. Romancing the Stone is absolute because it's comedy and it's got romance. It's in oh, a okay, okay. It's in an adventure format, but but Warm, yeah, Bo Warm Bodies is great. Warm Bodies. I watched as I was beginning to watch it. I was like, because this was during the whole zombie craze of like yeah. seven years ago. And I thought, not another zombie movie, my God. <laughs> but this movie is so good. It is so funny and warm and interesting. And it's just a great story. 50 Days of Summer, which I'm sure some of you are regretting not. not 500. Mentioned. 500, sorry. 500 Days 500, of Summer. Yeah. No, no, he only wanted 50. Yeah. He only. <laughs> Going back to my childhood, <clears throat> Va uh, Valley Girl. I don't know how good it is. I don't know how it stands up, but <laughs> uh, say anything, of course. Oh yeah, Tra oh, train wreck, yeah. which I find to be delightful. Yes, uh, train wreck. Yeah, with uh, Amy Schumer. Hmm. 
Sleepless in Seattle. I got to mention that. I don't know how good it is, mm-hmm. but uh, while you were sleeping, and Pretty in Pink, Notting Hill, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, Knocked Up, oh, yes. uh, Knocked Up, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Ruby oh, yeah. Ruby Sparks, Midnight in Paris. No one mentioned like. Um, I left out so many of these that are great. <laughs> uh, what's What's Woody Allen's best or... movie of all time? Uh, uh, Annie Hall. Of uh, course. Annie Hall. Yeah. Yeah. I also love Vicky Cristina Barcelona. That is a great movie as well. I love that movie. La La Land, Friends with Benefits, Jerry Maguire, Crazy Rich Asians, Crazy Rich Asians, Bridget That's Jones. That's my favorite. Is Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Jerry Maguire is so great. The, the soundtrack of those Cameron Crowe movies are yeah some of the best stuff. Sixteen Candles. About a boy, the wedding singer coming to America, and there's something about Mary. Nice. If the if the John Hughes movies had a battle, which one would win for y'all? Would it be <laughs> Breakfast Club? I think it'd be Breakfast Club, yeah, because one that's rewatchable and it is interesting. And although, like, what what are all the John Hughes movies? Because he made a well, lot. That one, Pretty in Pink. Um, this might be sacrilege, but. Is Revenge of the Nerds? No? No. No, uh, that's not. Ferris Bueller, 16 Candles Breakfast Club. Oh, God, Ferris Pretty Bueller. Pink. For me, there's no... Comp- the, Ferris, for me, is the tops. Uh, Weird Science, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Home Alone, Uncle Buck, National Lampoon's Vacation, Some Kind of Wonderful. Actually, it might be Some Kind of Wonderful. That was my favorite back then. Uh, mm. She's Having a Baby, which is not great. Mr. Mom... Mr. Mom's pretty great. Ah, oh, Michael Keaton's phenomenal in that. Yeah. Uh, the Great Outdoors, Dennis the Menace, Career Opportunities. Wait. Yeah. He he made Career Opportunities? Inter- oh, yeah. He wrote it. He wrote Career Opportunities. Well, there you go. Didn't know that. Um, I, I just think, like, man, Ferris is like, maybe when I watched it, it was just, it was an unbelievable experience. It was like, one of the movies that we watched at my school, every now and then we would watch a movie. There was Ted, uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure was one of them. Classic. Ferris Bueller's Day Off was another one. And Lost Boys was the other one. And all three of those, maybe it's because of how I watched them, but it was just so good. For me, Breakfast Club, I was 14 when I saw that in the theaters. Like That is like, I was the exact age mm. someone needs to be to watch that movie. And as subsequently I've watched it, you know, over the years. And each time I watch it at different stages of my life, I see different kinds of things. And it came out in 1985. And there's something about 1985. Everything 1985 to me is the best thing that ever happened. Like movie or uh, songs, 1985 top 40 is like these just amazing songs. Careless Whisper by George Michael. Like a Virgin Madonna. Eh, not the best Madonna song. Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. Um, <laughs> I, I, I Want to Know What Love Is by Foreigner. I Feel For You by Chaka Khan. Out of Touch by Holland Oates. Everybody Ooh. Wants to Rule the World by Tears for Fears. Ooh. Money for Nothing, Di- Dire Straits. Crazy For You by Madonna. That's a good Madonna song. Yeah. Take On Me, Aha. Whoa, that's Heavy a hitter. classic, man. Yeah. Easy Lover, Philip Bailey and Phil Collins. Great song. Nice. Uh, can't stop the Can't Fight This Feeling by Ario Speedwagon. Nice. We built this city starship. The power Whoa. of the power of love, Huey Lewis. It's just wow. another Sunday. Don't you forget about me, Simple Minds. Cherished by ah. Cool and the Gang, which is a classic song. Uh, Saint Elmo's Elmo's Fire by John Parr, which is terrible. Oh, I love it. The Heat is on Glenn Fry. We Are the World, USA for Africa, <laughs> Shout Tears for Fears, Part-Time Lover Stevie Wonder, great song, uh, Saving All My Love for You, Whitney Houston, Heaven by Brian Adams. Oh my God, so good. Ooh, so um, heavy songs, man. Cool It Now, New Edition. We gotta cool <laughs> it now. Miami Vice theme song. <laughs> Lover Boy by Billy Ocean, which is a just a jam. Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, Sheila. Oh, Sheila by oh. Ready for... Oh, yeah. Oh, oh Sheila. Sheila. Yeah. Rhythm of the Night. Da, 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 the Rhythm of the rhythm Night. Of the night. Yeah. Dance until the morning light. <laughs> by oh, yeah. The Barge. Um, the Barge, yeah. Uh, One More Night by Phil Collins. Great, great slow song. Sea of Love, Honey Drippers with Robert Plant. A View to a Kill and The Wild Boys by Duran Duran. That's the one. I, I was thinking because 
Umberto had said, or you, or he started singing the one from Octopussy yeah. earlier, All Time High. And I know that's an 80s more, but yeah. it was, okay, that's an earlier one. View to a Kill was this year. <laughs> yeah. You're the inspiration by Chicago. Oh, my God. Ooh. Uh, Neutron Dance Pointer Sisters. Great song. We Belong, <laughs> Pat Benatar. Night Shift, mm-hmm. Com- Night Shift by Commodores. Great song. Uh, Howard Jones, Aretha Franklin, Corey Hart, Never Surrender. Uh, let's see. Oh. Never Surrender. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah. I mean, just go. the list just goes on. Raspberry Beret by Prince. Oh, wow. Uh, Boys of Summer by Don Henley. Mm, <laughs> One Night nice. in Bangkok by Murray Head. Oh, I love One it. One Night in Bangkok. From when the world the samba. Obsession <laughs> by Anna Motion. Do you remember that song, Birdo? It's an obsession. Yeah. You're my obsession. Or would you want me to, to be, be to when get you sleep, sleep with me? With me. <laughs> um, if you love someone, set them free by Sting. Great song. Uh, we don't need another hero. The theme from, from Thunderdome. The Mad Max Three. Yeah, <laughs> Tina Turner. Oh God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Well, that part is awesome. I mean, Head over heels awesome. by Halt by Tears for Fears, which Ooh. is my favorite Tears for Fears song. Smooth operator. Um, mm, the smooth operator. Yeah, Glory Days by Bruce Springsteen. That's a jam. Voices carry till Tuesday. Oh man. Uh, what I lie to you, your rhythmics. Uh, let's see. It, I mean, it. Summer of '69. Brian Adams, "Walking on Sunshine." That, walking oh, on nice. sunshine. Oh. Yeah. I always thought that they were saying, "In the nighttime, you're so scary." <laughs> oh, 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 in the nighttime, you're so scary. Do oh, a cover. That's... Make it, make it scary. <laughs> you so scary. Give it a whole. Give it a whole you're meaning. so scary. Whole new meaning. <laughs> you so scary. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that's what they were saying. <laughs> So my cousin, uh, you know, the song, um, another one bites the dust. Yeah, my, yes. my cousin, he thought it was cause you know, uh, you know, Freddie Mercury will say another one bites the dust. Ah, he says that yeah. a lot. Of, my yeah. cousin thought it was another one bites the doctor. Yeah. No, I think, I think we talked about, I, I feel like I felt the same thing when I was a kid. Like I, I would hear it on the radio and I was like, what's wrong with the doctor or something? <laughs> He's a very bad dentist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Thompson Twins, Heart, What About Love? And oh, Heart. Oh, yeah. please. Uh, fresh by Cool and the Gang. She's fresh. Uh, let's see. Oh, Jermaine Jackson, Do What You Do. That is one oh. of my favorite songs of all time. Do what you do when you did what you did, did, what you did for me. me. Um, let's see. It's Sting, Fortress Around My Heart, another great song. Penny Lover, Lionel Richie. I mean, this this is the top 100, Sugar Walls by Sheena Easton. Naughty song. It's getting crazy, man. There's yeah. so many. Right. 1985. 1985 is solid. Especially here. So I say John Hughes movie. Uh, and guess what <laughs> movie came out in 1985? <laughs> what? Uh, is it Back to the Future 85? Uh, mm. Let's see. Let me type it in here. Back to the Future, yeah. Yeah. See, I told what is, you what is Empire? Very important. That's Empire is 80, 1983. Oh, oh, fuck. No, no, sorry, 80, 80. Yeah. Uh, Return is 83. Yeah. Uh, by the way, oh, another thing that happened in this movie, in um, the one we were supposed to be talking about, uh, all of a sudden a song starts playing that I hadn't heard since high school. And I'm like, oh my God, is that Genesis? And it was. It was this instrumental track called The Brazilian from Genesis' Invisible Touch album. Oh. And I used to have the Invisible Touch album, and it was one of the ones that I listened on repeat when I was in high school. God, but I seriously a... probably had not heard it since then. So it was like, it was a time loop. I'm like, oh my God. Is that when they're dancing? When they do the no, denim? it's when she's actually doing the quantum physics research, I think. Oh, it's a engine background. Okay. Yeah, I thought the music was pretty good. It's Colin, did you say your favorite John Hughes movie? I would, I would also echo Breakfast Club, but and then just to play, you know, the the Colin advocate you could say mo- the moderator yeah uh, my second is Ferris Bueller so yeah, Rumble, yeah, Ferris. Rumble. all right everyone what do you think of this movie what did you pull away what is the meaning of life if you can comment below what is the meaning of life to you everyone out there please take care of yourself because you deserve it or as Rita Coolidge would say because you deserve it